who are able to, um, to make it today. And welcome to our first webinar of 2015. Uh, my name is Lori Kroger, and I'm the president and CEO of Pandora Org. And I want to let you know I have a deep understanding of the suffering and the needs of people with um, myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as ME, and fibromyalgia, and that's because I have both of them. And I'm certain you'll discover that um, patients and their families are at the heart of everything Pandora Org does. And I want to let you, I want to tell you a little bit about our organization first before I introduce Jared. Um, our organi organization is run by volunteers who are mostly patients. And we focus on research, education, and patient assistance program. Um, we offer education to healthcare providers and we hold patient empowerment meetings. Um, and our patient assistance program, they touch patients and their family's life at a very personal level. For example, um, some, some of you might, or some patients might be too weak to cook for themselves. And so in November, we launch, launched a new program called Pandora Delivers. And it's a program that delivers meals on a temporary basis to people who are in great need. Maybe they had surgery or they've had a severe collapse. And over the holidays, we delivered over 100 meals to patients and it had a real positive response. Um, even more than we had imagined. And we also have a Covered in Love program. We have a dynamic quilting team and they make handmade quilts and then those are distributed to people who are going through some hard times as just to let them know that they're not alone and they could wrap themselves in comfort in one of those wonderful quilts. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about our programs, you can go to pandoraorg.net to see those. Um, but today, we're going to have a privilege to hear a research report from Jared Younger. Um, he is the director of the Neuroimmune, um, I just probably said that wrong, um, Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory at University of Alabama in Birmingham. And we are making a major shift towards um, funding research for a cure. Um, our government only gives $5 million for ME research and $11 million for FM research. And as you can imagine, that's very low. It's paltry amounts compared to what these diseases cost us in lost productivity. So for us, it's paramount to fund research so that private investigators like Jared can continue their crucial work. Um, and private research also um, advances illness awareness and highlights um, the um, the terrific need for research funding. That is why we are inspired to fund private research. Um, and at the end of the Pres Jared's presentation, you'll also have the opportunity to support Jared and his work. Um, you'll be able to go to youcaring.com slash jyounger to make a tax deductible donation specifically for research. And 100% of what you donate um, through February 20th will go towards his lab, um, his research at the lab. Um, and a little bit more about Jared. He is a PhD. He recently moved from Stanford um, at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He gave a stellar presentation at the um, MECFS Symposium at Stanford and then again at the IACFS ME. And I have to say he was my favorite um, presenter. So I'm really happy he's with us today. Um, what I'm going to do is change the presenter um, 
to to Jared, and then he will continue on with his um, with his presentation. So I'm going to do that now. And as I'm doing that, you'll see a little control panel on your um, on the right side, and you can go into the chat um, and send us message or questions and that at the end, I will um, be answering questions. So, okay, Jared, um, okay, and do can you, you have see? your screen? Are you showing your screen? Yes, is it, can you see okay. the first slide? Yes. Okay, and can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> all right. Are we all ready? Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I am, um, as you just heard, I am a full-time researcher. I've spent my entire career trying to figure out chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and a few related disorders like Gulf War syndrome. And that's what I do and that's what my lab does so that that's we're totally invested in figuring these diseases out so I'm going to talk about a few different things but I'm going to talk mostly about some research that I did at Stanford University I was there for about eight years I just came over to the University of Alabama Birmingham was recruited just a few months ago so we're building up the program here at UAB and I'm going to tell you about the studies that we're starting here and some of them are going to start in February so we're going to cover all of that I'm going to probably take right at 40 minutes to describe everything you know obviously because of the title I'm going to talk uh, a lot about leptin and why that may be involved in pain and fatigue I'm going to focus on the fatigue angle but this is also applicable to chronic pain cognitive decline and a lot of other issues that you see with CFS and with fibromyalgia um, so Take 40 minutes and then we'll save about 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So real quick, just want to get out some disclosures, get those out of the way. I'm going to talk about a few experimental pharmaceuticals. I just want to make it really clear that nothing I talk about is approved for um, clinical use for CFS. In fact, basically none of them are approved, FDA approved for any clinical use. They're experimental things, they're things we're testing in the laboratory. Perhaps one day they'll make it where you can get it from your physician, but right now that's not the case. They're still research chemicals. Um, and I have no conflicts of interest, uh, no financial conflicts of interest. So let's get into it and um, you know, I can save a lot of time because I don't think I need to describe to you uh, what MECFS is and how much it affects you. Uh, we all know it's really bad. We all know that there are the treatment options are are far few between and they're not that good. And so my goal is to one figure out when someone has CFS and when someone has fibromyalgia, what is wrong with them, and two, how do we effectively treat it? So the goal is to allow people to get back to their normal active life and fortunately I'm not the only one working on this problem there are an increasing number of labs across the United States and across the world actually that are working on this exact same problem and you'll probably hear from some of them pretty soon through Pandora and we're all tackling this problem from different angles and that's good for individuals who suffer from these conditions because that way if one of us is wrong someone else may be right so together we'll get it figured out all, all coming at it from our different uh, perspectives. So um, let me tell you what this particular, I do a lot of research, I do brain imaging, I do immune testing, I do pharmaceutical stuff, whatever it takes to get the job done. But I'm going to focus mostly today on some immune monitoring stuff. This is trying to find a diagnostic blood test for CFS and that's, that's one of the things that's missing right now is a good blood test for the disease. Um, there is a I guess a classic way of trying to find a blood test, like there's blood tests for rheumatoid arthritis, for thyroid disorders, and there's a typical way that you go about doing that, which is you get hundreds or thousands of people with the disease, you get hundreds and thousands of people that don't have it, and then you screen a bunch of blood tests and you see which ones are higher in the patients than in the controls. And that's how you typically find blood tests, and that's why when you go to your physician, you'll usually get a lot of blood tests for 
autoimmune things, inflammatory things, and if one turns up really high, they'll say, okay, this looks suspicious. You may have this disorder or this other disorder. And I think that technique works really well in most cases where, you know, probably most things in our body when there's a disease state and you're measuring something in the blood, if you have an abnormally high level of that, like below some, you know, above some kind of threshold, it means that there's some disease process going on. On the other hand, if you have a relatively low concentration, um, you're probably doing okay. So in most cases, it's this absolute level, it's the value, it's the concentration of that thing in your blood. And I think that usually works, but I think with MECFS and fibromyalgia, this classic approach may not work. And I'll show you why I think that's the case. I think with some diseases, it's not the, the absolute concentration, it's not the level of the chemical that's important. Um, it can still be under this normal threshold. It, you can look exactly like a healthy individual if we only test you once. So it's not the level, but it's the fluctuations in that chemical that is driving the symptoms. And why would that be? Well, that would be the case if it's not that your levels are abnormal, it's that the target, what that chemical goes to in your body, that target is sensitized. And so if you have a sensitized target, you can have normal levels of something in your blood and it will still cause your symptoms. And so classic ways of doing immune screening will miss this every time if we use those. So I wanted to create a way to find blood tests even in cases where you don't have abnormal levels of things in your blood, but they're still driving the symptoms. That's going to make more sense in just a, about a minute. So let me show you what this means. If you have MECFS, you, you're going to feel fatigued pretty much every day. But if you, if you keep a diary, if you take a fatigue diary, and we give people um, Android phones to do this, but you can do it on tablets, you can do it on an Excel file on your computer. If you keep track of your fatigue, every day or even multiple times a day, like in the morning, midday, and night, you'll see that not all days are the same. You probably know this even without tracking your fatigue. When we look at people's data, when they put it into these handheld computers, we'll see something a lot like this. So this is a typical MECFS person who also has fibromyalgia. Um, over about two weeks, we see 15 days down here. And on the left here, this is how much fatigue they're experiencing. So higher numbers mean higher fatigue. So if you look at this typical person, what you'll see is there's a lot of variability. There's day-to-day -day fluctuations in their fatigue. And I think those day-to-day -day fluctuations are the key to understanding CFS. Because why are those things fluctuating? Why is it that someone doesn't feel the same all the time? And what can we learn from that? So in particular, you know, we know that People are going to have really bad days sometimes, but every once in a while they may have a relatively good day. It may not be a perfect day. This, this one is about a 15 out of 100, so there's still fatigue, but compared to some of these other days, that's a pretty good day. And it's those good days that really fascinate me because if a person can have even one good day, that means they're physiologically capable of having a lot of good days. That means the body and the brain can do it. And so the question to me is, what distinguishes that good day from that bad day? What's physiologically distinct about that good day? And how can we recreate that? What chemical do we need to shift in order to make that, that person's every day? So the way I go about doing this in this particular study I'm describing is we've got this blue line, which is the person's self-reported fatigue severity. So we already know that. But then we go and we take blood draws from those people over the same period of time. Um, in most of my studies, I do it for even 25 days. That's 25 consecutive days of blood draws. And then we analyze different things in the blood. And what we're trying to find is something in the blood that can track with the ups and downs of fatigue severity. So this red line is a hypothetical thing in the blood, maybe an inflammatory chemical that goes down when fatigue goes down and goes up when fatigue goes up. So if we see something like this, where the red line is closely matching the blue line, that tells us something really important. That means there's something in the blood that very closely tracks with that person's symptom severity. And whatever this chemical is, 
that may be the target for a new treatment. So that's what this study is basically about. And I'm going to tell you some preliminary results we have from this, and I'm going to tell you what we're, what we're going to do next with it. So let me go into the approach, how we actually do this study. This is a kind of a mock-up of how we get the data. Um, the self-report data is critical, um, so we have people fill this out at least twice a day when they're in our studies and we give them the handheld phone and it's a 0 to 100 scale and you can just drag this bar around to uh, provide levels of your fatigue and there's also questions about cognitive impairment and sleep problems and so we try to get a lot of different things not just fatigue but the focus is on fatigue and the, and the nice thing about these devices is they can communicate back to us in the lab via 3G or 4G or Wi-Fi and we get the data in real time and that way um, you know we know that people aren't filling it out right before they come into the lab because everything's time and date stamped um, but it also means we can see if someone forgets to do a few and then we can call them and say hey you haven't been filling out your questionnaires and that's that's really helpful to make sure we get all the data so we collect that that's the easy part the complex part relatively is the blood draws so it's critically important that we get blood draws on consecutive days so we have something to see if it follows the good and bad days. Now, that may sound really difficult. And in fact, I think most people, when you hear, you know, you're going to do a study where you do 25 consecutive days of blood draws, you're like, I, you know, I don't want to do that. But it actually isn't that bad. And there's a few reasons why it's not as bad as you might think. One of them is that we take a very small amount of blood. In fact, the amount we need to do the test is like a couple of drops. So it doesn't take much blood. Uh, I want to show you a picture of these are our first three participants and these are their arms um, after the 25th day. This is directly after their last blood draw in the study and you can see that even when you've had your blood drawn for 25 consecutive days if you have really good nurses which we do and if you use really tiny needles which we do then you can get through that looking really good so it is possible to do that um, with very little discomfort and without causing any kind of bruising so we did this to start, I only did it like everything else in science, you do a test first on a small number of people. And if that looks good, you move on to a larger group. And if that looks good, you move on to a larger group. That's exactly what we're doing. But the first test I did was on three women who had both CFS and fibromyalgia. And I didn't know what to expect, so I ran a large number of inflammatory tests. And there was about 50 of them, and this is the list of them. And when I tested all three women, and tested all of these things in the blood, only one of them came out significant in all three individuals. And that was uh, a hormone called leptin. And I'll tell you what leptin is about in just a minute, but let me show you what the data actually look like. So the blue line here is their fatigue severity. This is person one, person two, and person three. The green line is the serum level of leptin. So how much leptin is flowing through their system. You see with this first person, as their fatigue went up, their leptin levels go up as well. So this, they were very closely related in person one. In person two, the two were also very closely correlated. On, on the days when the fatigue was particularly high, the leptin levels were rising as well, and then they dropped down with the fatigue. And on person three, not quite as pretty as the first two, but the two are still significantly correlated. So in all three women, there was some kind of relationship between the leptin, whatever that is, and their fatigue. And so this is very unlikely to come out by chance alone, so I was intrigued very quickly and thought we may be on to something here. So I started looking into leptin because leptin initially confused me, and the reason is because we think of leptin as something that suppresses our appetite. So leptin, this is the, the chemical leptin, it's actually produced by fat tissue, a white adipose tissue. Um, it's produced in order to suppress our appetite. So after you eat, it tends to be produced more. Um, it's increased with obesity. Um, probably more importantly though for the present discussion is for some reason, leptin levels are three times higher in women than in men. 
Don't know exactly why. It probably has something to do with estrogen because estrogen increases leptin, but it's multiple times higher in women than in men. And most importantly, it is a very potent inflammatory agent. So it provokes an inflammatory response in your body and in your brain. Um, and we didn't know that until more recently. We used to think it was just for suppressing appetite uh, to tell your body that you're full, but now we know that it can cause these inflammatory responses. In particular, it can cross into your brain, it goes through the blood-brain barrier, and it affects immune system cells called microglia. And these microglia, these are the, this big cell right here, the microglia are basically the guards of our central immune system. They are our primary immunological defense. They're looking for viruses, they're looking for bacteria, they're looking for any kind of problem, and it's their job to, to destroy that problem so, so you can be healthy. So they're typically in this, uh, what, what I like to call a patrolling state. Some people call it resting state, but they're not actually resting. And they have these long arms, and they're surveying your environment for problems. So they're just looking for anything that's wrong with, uh, with these little projections. If they find a problem, they undergo a really quick and a pretty extraordinary change. What happens is if they find a virus and they see a problem, they pull in all those arms into the body and they take on the circular shape and then they start to pump out all these pro-inflammatory factors. And these pro-inflammatory chemicals then change the function of neurons and they make you feel really sick. So what we know about these classically is this is the system that makes you feel horrible when you get the flu. So if you have microglia activation in your brain, they release these pro-inflammatory factors, it's going to cause all of these symptoms right here, or most of these symptoms, and we see this in basically every mammal, uh, mammal species. It's preserved in humans. This is a very, very old system. Um, so microglia activation means you're going to feel bad, and we call that the sickness response. So these are typical kind of flu-like experiences. The most common ones are achiness in the body, profound fatigue, and a kind of inability to think and concentrate. And there are a few others, but uh, these top three are the ones you see the most. So our body does that. There's actually a reason why. And we think that the microglia do that to us because it forces us to go to bed. It forces us to rest. And that way the body can devote all of its resources into fighting off the infection. So if you get a flu or another kind of infection, this is a very important response because if you went out and you would keep working, your body wouldn't have enough resources to fight off the infection and you might die. So it's very important that we feel horrible when we're sick so we just lay down and we don't do anything else. So that's how the system is supposed to work. And that's how it usually works for most people. But what I think in MECFS, the system is broken. And basically it's kind of like an alarm system that's no longer functioning properly. It's going off all the time. So what does that look like? Well, these cells, once they find a virus, they're supposed to activate and then once that problem is gone, they're supposed to go back to their normal state and then you feel better. That's the typical way. But what we know from more recent research, uh, this is almost all animal research, I don't do animal research, but we rely on those reports to inform what's going on because it's basically impossible to do this kind of research in people because we can't take these cells out of uh, living people's brains. But what the animal research has shown is that in addition to being the two states I told you about previously, one being patrolling, which is the normal state, and then one being the activated state, they can also enter a third state, which is called primed or hypersensitive. And when they're primed or hypersensitive, they kind of, uh, I don't know, it kind of looks like they're angry. They overexpress all of their receptors that are looking for problems. So, so now they're really, really looking for for problems, almost too much, they're oversensitive. And so it takes very little stimulus to cause them to jump into their active fighting inflammatory mode. So think of this as being a hair trigger. Now there's a lot of things that can take a microglia cell and turn them into hypersensitive cells. Um, a few of them, and there's more than I have listed here, but normal aging will do this. So as we get older, our microglia will become more sensitive. 
Um, if you have a massive immune insult, like maybe Epstein-Barr virus, uh, maybe a bacterial thing like Lyme's disease, that might result in uh, sensitization of the microglia. If you have a lot of immune hits, even if they're small, but you have a lot in a row, that might do it as well. Um, there's some evidence that even taking certain drugs like uh, opioid medications, perhaps over a long period of time, may sensitize microglia. Uh, chronic stress can do it, and uh, obesity can do it as well. So there are a number of things, uh, environmental things like breathing in diesel particles, that might cause sensitization of microglia. So once the they're sensitized, now they can start reacting to things that they're not supposed to. And I think that's the problem in, in the CFS, that instead of reacting to viruses and bacteria, they're starting to react to things like your own body's endorphins, which are supposed to make you feel good, but may actually activate these microglia. So if you try to exercise, instead of that making you feel better, that's going to make you feel worse. So just to show you that these aren't just cartoons that I draw, these are actually real cells. Um, here on the left, this is a normal microglia cell. This is when it's looking for problems. This is the angry hypersensitive cell. And you can see it has more of these uh, little projections and it has more receptors. And then these are two states at the bottom of activation. So this is a fully activated cell. So it's really this one, this B uh, panel, that I think is the key to CFS. I think that the microglia have been primed they're hypersensitive, and now every little thing you do is setting them off, pushing them into activated mode, so they pump out these chemicals to make you feel horrible. So it's essentially like you keep getting the flu, but you're not actually getting any kind of infection. It's all happening in the central nervous system. So what does this have to do with leptin? Because this is a story primarily about leptin. Well, when I started digging into it, I didn't know this before I did the study. But when I started looking, I found out that leptin sensitizes microglia. So I don't want to spend too much time with this, but just to kind of quickly go over it, if you administer leptin to microglia cells, it doesn't really do anything to them by itself. And by the way, we're, what we're looking at here, this right here is the amount of tumor necrosis factor alpha released from the microglia cells. The higher the TNF alpha release, the more pro-inflammatory action is occurring. So, you know, a release up here would make you feel very, very bad. Um, so this is pro-inflammatory activity. So if you give leptin by itself, which is this bar here, it doesn't really do anything. Now, if you administer something called lipopolysaccharide, that's something that tricks your brain into thinking you have a bacterial infection. You can see that lipopolysaccharide makes your microglia activate, and that's what's supposed to happen. But here's the interesting thing. It's this last column here. If the microglia have been exposed to leptin and then it's exposed to this fake bacteria, it activates much more. It creates a lot more of the tumor necrosis factor, so you feel much more sick. So this is what I think is happening. The leptin in people with ME-CFS, it's sensitizing the microglia, and now the microglia, it takes much less to activate them, and then when they do activate, they activate to a much greater degree. So here's the whole process as I think it occurs in a fibromyalgia and MECFS. You have normal microglia. Something has happened. Uh, many candidates, it turns it into a sensitized microglia, and then they start to react to things in the body. They activate, they put out these pro-inflammatory factors, they sensitize the neurons, and that's the process that makes you feel horrible. So that's the, whole, that's the whole scheme. This is my working hypothesis, and all of my research is testing this hypothesis in different ways. So let's get, let's get to some newer data and some more exciting stuff. So after we did the first three people, I was like, okay, there's something going on here. We need to test this some more. Let's test it in 10 more people and see if we can replicate this finding. So we took, uh, this was a study done um, a little while ago at Stanford. Um, we took 10 women with MECFS. Um, mean age was 53 years. We excluded a bunch of um, uh, infectious diseases and autoimmune stuff, so we wanted a pretty clean MECFS sample, as clean as possible. And we did the 25 days of self-report fatigue, and we did 25 days of blood draws. And our primary hypothesis was that leptin was going to be the best predictor of their day-to-day -day fatigue swings. 
but we're also going to test some other things. But the primary hypothesis, because of our first three people, was that leptin was going to be the cue. So let me tell you what we found. Now, the, the interesting thing when you do daily blood draws on people, we can actually look at each person individually, which is a, a, a very different way of looking at scientific data. And I'm glad we're able to do that. So I'm going to show you all 10 people. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. So this is participant one. And what we're looking at here is this is their fatigue over 25 days. So this is a whole 25 day period. The green line is leptin. Now, if you like, if you're someone who likes scatter plots, I'm, I'm not going to talk about them, but they're always over here on the right. And basically, you interpret these scatter plots. If the slope is diagonal, it means that there's a significant relationship between the two. And if the slope is flat, it means that the two aren't related. So, in this case, yes, as the fatigue dropped in our first person, leptin levels were also dropping. So, leptin and fatigue are definitely related in person number one, so that's very exciting. Person number two, same thing. The fatigue and leptin are moving together. They seem to be, for whatever reason, uh, they're related and significantly related. Now we did person three, and person three did not show a relationship at all between their fatigue and leptin. And I think it's important to note that I, I very much doubt that we'll ever find that everyone who's diagnosed with MACFS actually has the same disorder. I think some people are misdiagnosed and some people may be having another problem. So that's something to keep in mind, but this person did not show the leptin relationship. Person number four did show a relationship between the two. Person number five, I think this is probably the strongest one. You can see that basically every time their fatigue took a bump over those 25 days, the leptin was also moving along with it. So this is a good example of someone who has an incredibly strong relationship between their leptin levels and their fatigue. So, you know, this person definitely there's an effect. And again, there's very little chance this could be just a chance finding, you know, low, low probability that this is a false positive. These two things are almost certainly related in these individuals. Person six, another great relationship. Uh, we see that over the 25 days, this person was gradually getting worse. Their leptin levels were gradually increasing as well. Person seven did not show a relationship. Person eight showed an anti-relationship. So every time their leptin levels went up, their fatigue went down. Uh, so that's a significant negative relationship, and I don't really have a way to interpret that right now. just want to show you what that looks like. Person nine had a significant relationship. And then person 10 didn't really have much of a relationship that we could tell. They might be anti-correlated again, so I may have to take a closer look at that. But basically, we looked at 10 women. Six out of those 10 showed that leptin strongly predicted how bad they were feeling that day. And that's, that's incredible. That's exactly what we were hypothesizing. We also looked at 10 healthy women. Uh, women with no signs or symptoms of MACFS. I just wanted to make sure that leptin wasn't related to fatigue in general, and it's not. So basically, none of these individuals had a strong, significant relationship between leptin and their fatigue. So it may be unique to MACFS, which is very, very important. One other little thing I'm going to show you, and then we're going to talk about some of the implications of this, is we measured leptin, but I also measured a bunch of other things. And so I wanted to make sure that I was right that leptin was indeed the most important thing we measured in the blood. So we did um, a network analysis, and that's where I throw into the algorithm the people's fatigue, all their leptin values, and then all the other cytokine values all at once. And I tell it, just show me what's the best pattern that predicts the relationships. And this is what it gave us. So we didn't tell it to pull out leptin or fatigue. This is exactly the way the machine provided us with the data. And basically what it shows is out of all of these things we measured, leptin is the only thing that has a direct relationship with fatigue. So leptin in this case appears to be the gateway. Now leptin is related to a lot of other things in turn, such as interleukin-6, which is something you can see in inflammatory disorders, but none of those other things had a direct relationship with fatigue. So that's very, very interesting. And the question is, why is leptin, out of all these inflammatory things, why is leptin so important? So this is one of the things we have to figure out. 
So let's get into some, because uh, we don't have a lot of time, uh, probably want to wrap this up in about 10 minutes so we have time for questions and answers. So let me give you the story so far, and then we'll talk about what that means to people right now with MECFS and some of the stuff we're doing in the future. So basically, it is very rare in science to see something that's measured in the blood correlate so well with something that someone is reporting. We very, very rarely see that tight of a relationship. So I can say with a very high degree of confidence that leptin, for some reason, is related to fatigue and MECFS. We don't know how exactly, but those two have a relationship. We need to figure out why that is. So the overview, the hypothesis is people with MECFS, they have leptin levels. When their leptin levels are high, it's sensitizing the microglia. Those microglia then go into their activated state and they make you feel sick because they produce pro-inflammatory factors in the brain. Um, it doesn't mean that any damage is being done. It basically means that your brain is being tricked into thinking you have an infection when you actually don't. And these are all the, the inside symptoms. Like this wouldn't trigger runny nose and sore throat because that's a completely different channel. So that wouldn't be activated. So you basically have all the internal aspects of being sick, but none of the external signs of being sick. So let's talk about the stuff. I'm always looking in the future. That's what scientists do. So let me tell you what's coming up next. So a few things I want to talk about briefly. Um, again, nothing I'm talking about here, especially the drugs, are things I'm recommending anyone try right now. We're doing the research. We will let people know as soon as we find out that this is the way to go. I just want to tell you the kinds of things we're working on. For one, if leptin really is the culprit here, and I'm not saying it is, but, but if it is, there are many different ways we could develop drugs to block leptin. And we're not going to go into the slide very much, but these are different methods of creating drugs to block leptin. So it's possible, and there's a lot of different ways it can be done, and a lot of these are already developed, and they're just used in animals. I don't think that blocking leptin is probably going to be the best way to go about this because leptin is so important. I mean, for one thing, if you wipe out your leptin levels, you will be hungry all the time. You'll have an appetite that will not be suppressed no matter how much you eat. That's, of course, not going to be a healthy thing. So we can't wipe out leptin. And leptin interacts with a lot of immune system cells. That's what this slide shows. So I'm afraid that if we knock leptin levels too low, it may hinder your immune system's ability to fight cancers or to fight real infections. So we have to be really careful if we're going to chronically suppress leptin. That might not be the right approach. So for right now, um, there may be other more holistic non-pharmaceutical methods of controlling leptin. Now I'm going to mention a few things because research shows these things are related to leptin, but I don't know, I'm not suggesting that they're actually treatments for MECFS, just that they do affect leptin levels. Um, one of them is fasting. Um, if you fast for two to three days, your leptin levels will go down very low. Um, I, I would never recommend someone fast a lot to control fatigue, but um, it is something that lowers leptin. We know that emotional stress increases leptin considerably, so meditation techniques can decrease leptin levels. Um, weight loss, uh, as you lose fat tissue, your leptin levels decrease. Um, if you avoid stress eating, that lowers leptin levels, and if you eat a low glycemic index diet, that will reduce it as well. Also, exercise decreases leptin, um, but the problem is the exercise may also cause those microglia to go into their activated state. So maybe long term it would help, but you'd have to push through the short term effects that it makes you feel horrible in a lot of cases. So very, very complex. And, and again, these things might help, but we don't know for sure until we actually test them. What is probably more interesting to me, instead of going after leptin directly, is to try to calm down those microglia. And that's actually what a lot of my research does, is I'm trying to get those those hypersensitive microglia cells back to their normal patrolling state. And so we're testing a lot of chemicals to see if they can actually do that. Now, if you've tracked my work, you know I do a lot of stuff with low-dose naltrexone, and right now that works extremely well for fibromyalgia. I don't know if it works specifically for MECFS because I haven't tested it. Some people say it helps with their fatigue. 
other people say it doesn't. So we just have to test it, and we'll do that. And there's actually a lot of other things that could be tested right now that calm microglia down and may help people with MECFS. All of the ones in yellow, these are drugs that could be used in clinical trials right now. The ones in red, these are things that are only being used in animals right now, but maybe in a few years, these may be tested in, uh, in humans. In the meantime, there's actually a lot of uh, complementary alternative uh, botanical agents that we now know through science suppresses microglia hypersensitivity and, and can calm them down um, and keep them from producing as many pro-inflammatory factors. A lot of these are old uh, Chinese medicines. Um, all, all these are botanical and food-based things. And I actually have a grant to study nine of these things in Gulf War syndrome. And Gulf War syndrome is a condition that looks very much like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And if any of those look good, uh, we may also try them in fibromyalgia and, and MECFS. Um, there's a lot of these that I think have the potential of really working well. I'm especially excited about curcumin, which comes from a turmeric. And uh, we'll see about some of these. Uh, we'll know we're going to start that study in probably about three months. So maybe we'll have some good new things from that. So a lot of the botanical things that could be tried. Uh, as far as other research projects, I mentioned this briefly, but I want to say it one more time that it is, again, it's very unlikely that everyone with MECFS has the same pathophysiological problem. So it's going to be really important that we find a way to subdivide people into their right kind of MECFS so we can treat them individually. And I think that this leptin test that I came up with may be one way to do that. Now, I don't think physicians are going to want to do blood draws on people every day for 25 days to test this, but it's possible we may be able to get just as good measures from saliva. And if you're getting it from saliva, now that becomes something that's actually doable because you can do that at home yourself and then send it in for the results. So maybe this leptin relationship will be some way of identifying a particular group of MECFS, maybe even the majority, who will respond to a particular type of drug. So. Right, last things I want to talk about before we take some questions is the studies that we're starting up right now. This is the most exciting stuff to me because uh, fortunately, you know, we've been given funds to do some really cool stuff and I, I'm really optimistic about the information we're going to get through these studies. Now, these are all studies that I'm creating at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. So most of these are things that are going to be open to people who are close by in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. So let me tell you about a few of these studies. Um, and again, this is going to be put on YouTube, I think, so this information is accurate as of January of 2015. I don't know, 20 years from now, it, it's not going to be as accurate, but um, here's the studies that we're starting up now. The first one is a much larger version of what I just showed you. So we showed these results to the reviewers at NIH. They really liked it. They funded us to do this in well over a hundred more women, which is great. Um, I'm really glad that NIH gave us this funds. As you heard earlier, it's really hard to get MECFS funds. Um, fortunately, at the very least, there's an MECFS specific review panel. So when I send in a grant for CFS, it goes to a special panel of MECFS experts. And that's really good because if it went to the general panels, we would never get funded because a lot of those people don't even believe in MECFS. So NIH has taken the first step of creating a special emphasis panel, and that's great, but now we need them to provide more funding for these types of grants. So anyway, I'm going to be doing a much larger version of the study with blood draws and uh, daily symptom reports. This one is just in women. Um, if you have fibromyalgia but you're not sure about MECFS, we're just going to invite everyone to do our screening and then we'll tell you if you actually meet our criteria. But you do have to be about an hour um, away from Birmingham to participate for that one. We compensate people pretty well for their, for their participation in the study uh, and we'll definitely do all the screening. I'll show you in a few slides where you can find out when that study starts recruiting. It'll probably start recruiting in about a month. Um, we're also looking for men with fibromyalgia, and we're looking for men with Gulf War syndrome. So people went to the 1991 Persian Gulf War who started to develop pain and fatigue symptoms afterwards. So that's one type of study. Uh, we also, you know, I know that leptin is related to fatigue. That's pretty obvious from looking at the slides. 
but we don't know for sure that leptin actually causes fatigue. It might be the other way around somehow. So to know for sure, we have to give people leptin to see how they react to it. So we're actually going to do a study at UAB where people come in, they'll stay for about half the day, and in the morning they'll get an injection of leptin, and we'll monitor their symptoms and monitor their immune response, and we'll compare that to people without ME-CFS, and we'll see if leptin actually is driving fatigue. Now leptin comes and goes really fast, so even if it made someone feel more fatigued, they'd be back to normal within um, a few hours probably. And we don't think it's going to make anyone sick. But these are the type of studies that prove that something causes something else. So it's a very important type of study. So we're going to be starting that in probably about a month. And then I'm really excited because I, I want to find a, a good test. I'm really excited about PET imaging. And that's called positron emission tomography. And this is a method that can show us when the brain is inflamed. And so basically, I think if you have MACFS, you have a low-level inflammation of your brain that we might be able to pick up with this uh, neuroimaging method. So this is a brain viewed from the top. Now, this is multiple sclerosis, so the inflammation is going to be much greater in these individuals. But you can see a healthy control here, and then in the MS patient, this green means the microglia are more activated. And this is exactly what I want to do for CFS, because if we show that MECFS has activated microglia compared to people without it, that would tell us that MECFS is a low-level neuroinflammation disorder, and then we'll have a lot of people jumping on with new treatment options. So this study, I'm going to start, um, it's probably going to be about four months from now, so probably early summer. And this is probably going to be done at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, which is about three hours away from me, because I really like their facilities. Um, but we may also do it at uh, UAB as well. And then, just about to wrap up, so we can take some questions. I also, of course, do treatment studies. Sometime this year, we will probably try Lotus Naltrexone for chronic fatigue syndrome. It seems like the next logical thing to test. And just to let you know, I can't talk about a lot of these, but we have other treatments that we're going to be trying um, in the near future to moderate future um, that we hope will really help with MECFS as well. So um, the best way, if you're interested in keeping track of what the lab is doing, and if you're interested in hearing when we start studies and how you can um, be screened for it, um, the best way to do that is to sign up for our newsletter. And again, because we're moving, I haven't set up a Facebook page and things like that yet, but we'll set that up soon. But for right now, the best way is the newsletter. And that's at our webpage, which is www.psyforpsychology.uab.edu backslash younger. And then on that page, you'll see a, uh, a place where you can put in your email address. And then whenever I write a newsletter, you'll get that in your inbox. And I just send a PDF newsletter, and then if you want to quit that at any time, you can do that. Um, my lab is significantly larger than this picture. Now I, it's grown to about 12 people in the last two months, so we're growing very, very rapidly, and I'll have a new picture up there uh, next Wednesday. So, um, But this is what our lab looks like. This is the page, and this is how you get the newsletter so you can keep up with the news of the lab. And again, I guess just to wrap up so we can take questions, um, the major point is we are working very, very hard on this. We are trying whatever research approach is needed to figure out what's wrong and how do we treat it. And so, you know, it's true that there's very little that someone with MECFS can take right now to improve their symptoms. And so I know it's frustrating and I know science takes, it seems like it takes a really long time. It is a slow process because we have to be very careful, but, you know, try to, be optimistic because there are a lot of people working on it and you know we're going at it as fast as we can and I think given the results we've had so far with a few more studies we may actually have something really really important that's going to translate into something that will help people so here's some of the credits for some of the images I used and that is uh, that wraps it up so let me stop there so we can have time for some questions okay I just unmuted myself but that was a fantastic um, presentation, Jared, and we have some really good um, questions that people have asked. I'm going to ask that you don't switch me to presenter yet because you might want to go back to use some of your slides um, to answer some of the questions. Okay. Okay. Um, just want to make sure you could hear me. Um, okay. And I'm going to just read what people, people wrote. Um, 
and some of them might overlap a little bit. But this one is, um, I love his theory about all the things that can be a trigger. Do you have an opinion regarding the epidemics that occurred during which the disease seemed to be contagious? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know too much. I'm not an epidemiologist, and so I haven't really followed those cases very closely. I know it's extremely interesting, and I don't know, I mean, I know the incidences um, you're talking about. I don't know if they ever pin that down to possible triggers, but certainly we know that things in the air, and I don't want anyone to be paranoid, but we know through animal research that even things like diesel particles, um, that are suspended in the air, like if there's an oil fire, even that, if that's being breathed in, that can cause microglia sensitization in, in uh, rodent models. And they looked at that because of Gulf War illness, they had these oil fires, and they thought that maybe the soldiers breathing in that oil fire is what sensitized their immune system. So um, I think given that so many things can sensitize the immune system, there might have been cases in the past where there was something that was exposed to a large number of people that could have given them similar symptoms that would have lasted for a long time. So it's certainly possible, but I don't have details on that. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, and another person um, wonder is wondering if low dose naltrexone affects this process of micro microglial sens sensitization and other factors. It does, um, and we know that for certain. When you take low dose naltrexone. It gets, in, it gets through the blood-brain barrier, and it interacts with a site on microglia. It's called toll-like receptor 4, and it reduces the sensitivity of the microglia. And that's, again, you can only see that through animal literature, um, and, but that's been done by other researchers. But I give it to people with uh, primarily fibromyalgia in clinical trials, and it does reduce their symptoms in the majority of cases. But yes, we do know that it, it decreases the sensitization of the microglia cells. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, and then this person asked um, the positive correlation between leptin and fatigue in the six out of ten is very interesting, but what about the causal um, mechanism? Yeah, and exactly, and that's why uh, these future studies are so important. So, of course, when I'm a scientist, when I see two things are correlated, I go, okay, that's cool. But that doesn't tell us causation. The only way to know causation is to experimentally administer something. And that's exactly what um, one of the studies, this leptin study here, that's exactly what that's going to do. So when we then inject someone with leptin and we can experimentally increase their levels, then we'll track what happens, and that's going to tell us if leptin is actually the cause. So if that comes out significant, if we inject people with MECFS with leptin and their immune system responds and they feel worse, that's going to tell me, okay, yeah, leptin is doing something, and then we can start trying to find ways to decrease leptin or uh, actually maybe interact with the leptin receptor to decrease that effect on your fatigue. Mm. Okay. And the same person, I, I just saw that, I think it was probably a continuation of um, question. Um, so if she wants to know if um, leptin is, um, is it really causative of the symptoms? In other words, will correcting leptin levels diminish symptoms or is it something else in the pre-gateway? I think you answered that. Right. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. And, and we really don't know until we test it out. All of those are possible. It could be that, you know, it's hard for me to come up with a mechanism, but it's we have to be open to the fact that or to the possibility that when someone gets really fatigued, for some reason, that causes leptin levels to change. So it may be the reverse order, and that wouldn't be very interesting because then changing leptin wouldn't help you at all. But I can't, we don't have, we don't know any mechanisms that would cause it to happen in that direction. So given all we know about leptin, it's very likely to be leptin causing the fatigue instead of the underway, other way around. But and we'll know for sure when we actually test it. Okay. Um, and then this person would like to know the weight of the healthy controls. Are, um, there are overweight people who have very high leptin levels who don't have um, MECFS and ditto people with other metabolic disorders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think, 
I mean, there may be a slight increase of incidence of fibromyalgia at least with obesity, but I don't think it's a very strong effect. So certainly when I'm looking at people with MECFS and fibromyalgia, I see the entire range of body mass index. So it is not a disease of obesity, definitely not. So it, it, the story is not going to be that simple. Our healthy controls, we because we realize the relationship between body mass and leptin, we actually controlled them subject to subject for weight. So they were matched by age and they were matched by weight. So everyone had the same, uh, the groups had the same average BMI and they were all paired up so they all had matches. So we controlled for fat tissue, body mass, and, uh, and age. And of course they were all women as well so we controlled for gender. And that's a good question. I mean it's things that we have to do to make sure that there's not another explanation for how the results turned out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's, I guess that was answered to with this other question was very similar. So you just answered that. Um, okay. And I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this word right. So I'm going to smell it. It's a smell it. Spell it. <laughs> Did you look at ghrelin? G-R-E-H-L-I-N? Oh, yeah, yeah ghrelin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't. That wasn't in our list. And the reason is because as, as important as ghrelin is to um, hunger, and ghrelin is basically your hunger hormone or one of your hunger hormones, so if you have an increase of ghrelin, you, you basically you want to eat stuff. Um, so it's the opposite of leptin, basically. Those are two opposing hormones. But no one has ever described ghrelin as having any kind of inflammatory, anti-inflammatory impacts. So the problem is, is ghrelin isn't in those panels that we use to test inflammatory stuff. So we would have to have a specific test just for that hormone, and that would mean um, that mean a lot of extra costs because when they're bundled together, you get them a lot cheaper. However, you know, I think it's logical and I think it's worth testing since Greenland is the opposite of leptin. Maybe if someone had a high level of Greenland, they would have lower fatigue. So I think at some point we should, at the very least, test it in the blood. And I think with the study that we're doing. Um, through NIH, we'll be able to actually uh, quantify Greenland. So I don't have the answer now, but when we analyze data in the future, we'll know more about what it does. Okay. Um, this person know. says, you looked at leptin fatigue and control subjects. Have you considered looking at the leptin fatigue response in other diseases where fatigue is present, like MS or cancer? Right, right, exactly. So just showing that, so a very good point, just showing that it's different from healthy controls, that is nowhere close to enough to tell you that this is specific to MECFS. So to do that, we'd have to show that it's unique from, yeah, rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, lupus, and you mentioned MS. So it's, it's tricky and it's expensive. First of all, it's expensive to do this even on one person because we have to assay so many samples per person because it's 25 days. So we have to be really selective. But what we need to do um, is select a few, maybe rheumatoid arthritis and a couple of other diseases and see if it's related. And either way it turns out, it's actually going to be interesting because if leptin isn't related to those other conditions, then that means we have something specific to MECFS. But if leptin is related to fatigue and severity in those other diseases, that may tell us that those two diseases may have something in common. And that gives us additional information because then we can take information from that other disease and maybe apply it to MECFS. So um, we're certainly going to try to do that. I just need to think of which diseases to do primarily. And that will be very informative when we try it. Okay. Um, can long-term night shift cause the amount of stress that would affect le leptin levels? That was long-term night, what? Night shift, working the night shift. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so leptin levels are extremely, um, I guess, malleable. Um, when you eat and when you sleep drastically changes your leptin levels and also your leptin levels fluctuate throughout the day. So you're going to get a bump every time you eat. So, you know, I don't know how to tell you exactly how it would affect it, but certainly if you're changing your sleep schedule a lot, that's going to, that's going to disrupt leptin levels. And I know for sure that if you have chronic, um, you know, if you have sleep apnea, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, we know for sure that that increases your leptin levels. So if you're getting poor sleep, you may actually have a boost of leptin levels, which 
for most people may not be a problem, but if you have MACFS, that might actually exacerbate your symptoms. Okay. Um, this person wants to know if um, pain meds can be taken with low dose naltrexone or does do you have to take it alone? Yeah, we're not sure because we've never tested it. Um, in the clinical trials, we've always excluded people, and I, and I think you're referring to the opioid yeah, painkillers, mm -hmm. the opioid analgesics like hydrocodone, oxycontin, things like that, because lotus naltrexone, naltrexone blocks opioid receptors. Opioid painkillers activate the same receptor. So theoretically, you don't want to give something that activates a receptor and something that blocks it at the same time or, or they'll counteract each other. Uh, the naltrexone would probably block the action of the opioids. So there's a theoretical risk, but that's where the low-dose naltrexone comes in because it's given at a dosage around 4.5 milligrams per day, which is much lower than the dosage you would use to actually purposefully block opioid receptors. That's around 50 to 100 milligrams a day. So it's possible that you could co-administer both because the naltrexone level is so low, but I don't know if there's any benefit to doing that. So I, so we haven't tested yet what happens when someone does both and whether you know, they actually feel better if it makes the opioids work a little less. So I think generally we would not recommend people do that. Um, we probably will test it. I do know some rheumatologists tell me that it's okay to mix the two, um, but I would say someone would have to do that pretty carefully. It's not that it's dangerous. It's just that if you're very reliant on your opioids uh, or your opioid medication and then you've suddenly blocked it, you'd have an increase of your pain. So you just want to have to be careful with that. Maybe by starting with a lower naltrexone dosage, like something even closer to one milligram, and then increase it if it seems like it's okay. And this is something where you just have to have a physician work with you and kind of monitor that pretty closely. Right. And like with all um, medications, the saying start low and go slow. And that even goes for the LDN. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody asks um, that they don't understand the relation between endorphins and microglia. Um, if she exercises um, later on in the day, she feels bad. Is that because of the endorphins or the microglia? So I haven't seen a lot of work on this, but here's, here's what I can piece together for you. So this is related to what we were just talking about, actually, which is opioids, opioid painkillers, in addition to latching onto neurons and decreasing your pain, at the same time they do that, they also go to that toll-like receptor 4 on your microglia and they actually cause inflammation. Now, in most people that's a relatively low level of inflammation, but it's true that when you give an opioid, you decrease pain, but you also increase inflammation. And over time, it's possible that the inflammation becomes greater. So that's one of the potential risks of opioids. And I don't know, I'm not saying that this is a risk to everyone, but we do know it can happen. Your endorphins are your own body's opioids. They're, they're chemically similar to when you're taking an opioid painkiller. So the same thing might apply if your microglia are sensitized and your body produces a lot of endorphins, those will go and those will dock on the receptors on the microglia and if your microglia are sensitized that could be enough to activate them so it might be possible that your microglia are actually reacting to the endorphins now that's all hypothetical that's never been tested I'm just piecing that together from other literatures um, we'd have to test that by you know I don't know you know we know that when people do an exercise test which typically causes you to release endorphins, we know that that wipes out people with MECFS. So there's some reason to believe that may be the case, but we don't know it's the endorphins uh, per se that are responsible. It'd be, we'd have to measure the endorphin levels and see if that predicts uh, the response, so the fatigue response after exercise. But it's definitely something worth looking closer at. Okay, there's a lot, um, a lot more questions, but I, I'm going to do the have this one be the last one, and okay. then we'll continue on. And what I will do is compile the questions and send them to Dr. Younger, so he could um, answer them, and then I could send send your the answers to you. Sure, um, okay. This person wants to know, do you think that this is central fatigue? You know how there's like the the um, 
in fibromyalgia, there's the centralization of, for pain. Is this central fatigue? I think so. Um, and again, that's my working hypothesis. It's, it's what drives my research uh, studies, but that's my belief. I think that chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and quite a few other conditions actually, uh, but ma mainly those two share a lot of the uh, pathophysiological mechanism. And I think basically all of that is happening in the central nervous system. So, you know, uh, you know about counter hypotheses that, you know, it could be problems of energy metabolism in the muscles and there's, there's peripheral explanations, but I'm definitely, my lab is about looking at the central nervous system in the, the brain and spinal cord issues with uh, CFS. So, yeah, that's my belief. My answer is that it is centralized fatigue. Okay. All right. And then if you can change the presenter back to me. Uh, and then I'll my best. start showing my... Uh, okay. There you go. All right. Um, go here. Okay. Can you see my screen? I've, I see a picture of me. Okay. <laughs> says Pandora, or uh, is that what you're meaning to have up? Okay. Um, about the fun doctor. Let's see if um. Actually, let me go and unmute um, Mike. Okay. I don't see the screen. But... Okay, Mike. Can you see my screen? He might not be there. I think he's still muted. Okay. Okay, Mike, are you there? No, we can't see your screen. Okay. I bet you can now. <laughs> okay. There it is. Oh, yeah. All right, yay. Okay, first of all, I want to um, thank you, Jared, for um, have, doing this presentation for us. It really um, is very interesting, the work that you're doing. Um, we really thank you for being having the inno innovation to um, have the foresight to check the leptin and the fatiguing issues and also to have an interest in helping patients that have ME-CFS. Um, so, and there's a lot of comments saying that people that has been listening today really enjoy your, your presentation. So, um, we also want to give you the opportunity to be able to support Dr. Younger's research. And so we have a link at youcaring.com and I'm going to show that to you, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, you're gonna see all kind of things from my screen, I think. Um, let's see, let's go down here. Okay, this is the crowdsourcing page, the youcaring.com. And this is where you can go and make a donation that will be tax deductible because um, we're a nonprofit organization that's collecting the money and then we will put, give 100% of your donation towards Jared's research. Um, you can make a difference no matter the amount that you give. Every dollar is appreciated. Um, and also, if you would like to make a donation to, um, to um, Pandora and for any of our uh, patient, uh, if you can tell, I have this and now my brain's getting tired. <laughs> there goes the word finding. But if you want to make any um, donation to any of our uh programs that we have, like the patient assistance program, you could go to pandoraorg.net and um, make a donation there. We are going to have other 
webinars in the future. Um, next month will be Dr. Nancy Klimas, and we will be sending out um, an invitation for those and announcements, so keep an eye out for that. We would also like you to follow us on our Facebook and Twitter, and if you go to our um, our webpage, you'll be also able to be able to sign up for our newsletter. So I want to thank you again for um, coming to our first webinar of 2015, and I'm sure that you that his presentation probably has given me hope. When I heard it at Stanford, it was really hopeful to me, and I am very glad, Jared. Thank you for doing your work. You're very welcome. Happy to do it. Okay. Well, great. I'm going to end the um, recording and we'll keep an eye out on our um, Facebook page too and social media because once we upload um, the presentation, we will have a link to that. So especially for those people who have missed it, we'll be able to see it. So thank you. Bye, everyone.